Hello, agentpreneurs, and welcome to episode 53 of the Daily List Report. I'm Randy Shiozaki. I am a co-founder of List Reports, and I am your host of this show. Thank you for joining us today. We've got an incredible show. We've got George Ratiu. He is senior economist at Realtor.com. Previously, he was managing director of housing and commercial real estate, sorry, commercial real research at NAR, and he's going to give us his perspective on everything that he's been tracking about, what's going on with the economy, jobs housing, all of those things, tons of great updates. Before we get into that, real quick plug here, you're watching this on our YouTube channel, please make sure that if you like the content, you subscribe so you don't miss anything. We've got 52 episodes of amazing content here, thought leaders, product updates, new product launches, industry leaders, everything, lots of good stuff here, so make sure that you subscribe. So, with that, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to bring George on right now. George, why don't you say... Hello to the agentpreneurs of List Reports. Hello, good to, to be here and um, be able to chat a little bit today. I'm really excited about this, George. Thank you so much for taking the time. There's a lot going on. I imagine that we could probably talk for hours you know, with everything that's happening in the world right now. There certainly is a lot. You're right, a lot happening, a lot to talk about, um, and, and a lot of nuance too to a lot of the, uh, the things out in the market. A lot of nuance, absolutely. George, why don't we do this? I'd love to give our guests an opportunity to just give a, a quick intro on themselves. I, I want everyone to get to know who you are and you're eminently qualified to be talking to them about what's happening in the world. So why don't you just take a minute and kind of introduce yourself? Absolutely, and I appreciate the, the opportunity, uh, Randy. Absolutely. Um, I uh, currently um, serve as a senior economist with Realtor.com. Uh, looking at macroeconomic conditions, um, capital markets, monetary policy, and how all those interact with real estate markets. Um, and the interesting thing that I enjoy about the current um, uh, position is the fact that I get a lot of insight into consumer trends from obviously a technological um, centric company, you know, a tech platform. So that really helps inform some of the uh, really up to the minute trends in the market. Prior to Realtor.com, as you mentioned, I worked with the National Association of Realtors for a little over a decade. It was a great opportunity. I had, in fact, uh, been based in Washington, D.C. right before the 2008-09 recession hit. In a sense, you could say I had a front row seat at a lot of the things that were happening in Washington at the time. Got to see the monetary policy in action, legislative, regulatory actions, a lot of the effort that went into trying to shore up at the time the economy and real estate markets. Um, and so it's been a very informative um, period for me. And um, I actually had the great opportunity to, in a sense, um, look at both residential and commercial markets. So I got really the full spectrum of investment market fundamentals activity. And frankly, as, as you know firsthand, it has been quite uh, an amazing cycle. Yeah, it, it absolutely has. And, you know, George, that reminds me, that makes me think of actually a great starting point, which is there are some very fundamental differences between what's happening now and what happened in 08, right? This is not the same thing at all. So why don't you talk for just a moment about how do you characterize those differences? And I think there's a lot of hope in that, frankly. Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, I'm glad you brought it up. It's, it's something that I think it's worth keeping for perspective in mind as we look at what happens today. When you look at the last recession, really, it was driven by really a debt bubble, right? So we yes. had a lot of leverage in the financial system, and most of it predicated on housing uh, instruments, right? A lot of collateralized debt obligations tied to mortgages, and many of those subprimes. So when, when basically we had the financial crisis, you remember back October of 2008, we had several banks, Lehman being one of those, that started defaulting yes. um, in a sense that brought the entire economy down with it. We saw the default of banks through that, basically the spillover effect into other companies. And we saw um, obviously a significant layoffs. We lost about 9 million jobs in, in a couple of years. Um, significant. And with that, of course, we saw a lot of pain for many consumers, right? We, we saw foreclosures, we saw short sales a lot of delinquency, a lot of pain. Fast forward to this year, very different situation, right? We didn't really have an economic um, crisis per se. What we had was a health crisis. 
and in fact that, that a global one and the the health crisis the pandemic right the coronavirus pandemic led to very dramatic measures on the part of governments in a sense this time around unlike any other recession it was the government through quarantine and shelter at home orders that brought the economy to a standstill the interesting thing is given what we learned from the experience of japan uh south korea and of course china which came uh, ahead of us we we knew that this was going to be roughly two and a half to three month uh period and here we are slowly coming out of it so going in we knew that this was going to be temporary but at the same time going in we had no idea since we've never been here before how we all collectively are going to react right because companies uh, if you think of the economy, it really is a dance between consumers and companies. Consumers buy products that companies provide. And in, in, in that dance, in a sense, companies hire more people to build more products as long as we as consumers continue buying. When we run into an economic recession, generally in that dance is when consumers no longer have the ability to pay for, for goods or services, then companies retrench, cut back on jobs, and you have this downward spiral. So this time around, what we really have is a consumer base which went into this recession quite healthy. When you look at what household balance sheets, we were in good shape. Homeowner equity was at record levels. Hmm. Four out of 10 homeowners basically own their house free and clear with no mortgage, right? So by most indicators, we were on much better footing. And I think if anything, that's the silver lining as we look ahead to 2020 and beyond, the silver lining is um, with all this pain, and boy, have we had some pain. Look at the fact that it took us about 10 years to, to create a net of about 22 million jobs. And in one month, in April, we lost 20 million. So you can basically look at the fact that in one month, we wiped a decade's worth of job gains. So clearly there's a lot of pain. But all I'm saying is, it's a very different uh, environment. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the fundamentals were, were there, right? And in, you know, most of most of the GDP of this country, as you know way better than I do, right, is driven by consumption, right? Mm -hmm. um, not by manufacturing, right, and things like that. And so in one sense, this was like hitting the pause button. And so when you talk about, you know, in a traditional recession where people don't have the ability to buy goods and services, with the combination of the stimulus package and the overall equity the position that people had, people had the ability to, they just weren't able to, right? Like you couldn't go to a restaurant, which is different than I can't afford to go to a restaurant, which is interesting, exactly. right? Absolutely. And so I, I just, yeah. I think, I think George, one of the big questions is, and we can't answer this and so we can move on, right? But, you know, as we come through this, and, and frankly, if you look at the numbers, we aren't through this, right? We are reopening at a time when most other countries, frankly, didn't reopen. So we, this isn't over by any stretch of the imagination. It's unclear how many people are going to go back and spend the way that they used to spend. You're absolutely right. And in fact, I think that's, that's sort of the really large overhanging cloud is what is the health impact going forward? Mm -hmm. We clearly are seeing signs that, that things are improving, but we, you hear health experts, some of them are concerned about a second wave, maybe when, in the fall or winter when the weather returns, given that it's a viral um, a pandemic, that it, it, the virus can mutate. So obviously all of these are still having, a, a really, like I said, a, a huge cloud of uncertainty over the economy. Um, at, at the same time, exactly to your point, and it's worth uh, sort of reiterating, you're right. As, as consumers, we went into this really blocked from not so much because we weren't financially capable, but blocked simply by, by for health reasons mm -hmm. from spending money that we had and we normally would. So now that we're coming back, you can tell that really in a sense for a lot of companies, uh, the concern, and, and you saw this, you, you saw in, in the number of furloughs, in the number of quick and rapid layoffs, yes. companies were concerned about whether consumers are going to come back. And from early signs, what we're looking at, whether it's air travel, whether it's uh, even hotel bookings for, for summer, it's clear that it's a much more muted um, season already. 
But at the same time, to me, there are some hopeful signs. We saw them this morning the Mortgage Bankers Association released their latest um, applications uh, index, and um, purchase applications were up along with yeah. refunds. So clearly there's activity in the market. As we speak, people are still uh, looking, obviously, at buying homes. So to me, it signals that there's still a lot of strength in the economy and a lot of momentum, even yeah. with, with that pause. Yeah. Interesting. So, so let's talk about that, right? Let's shift gears a little bit, George. Let's talk about what's happening right now in the real estate market. Because, you know, some people like me are sitting on the sidelines and looking around and I see lots of activity. I see news and forecasts that prices are going to, I think the worst forecast I saw was that prices are going to dip by 1%. Best case was they were going to increase. So prices are holding, if not increasing, low inventory, super low mortgage rates. Like, just what's the state of the world right now as it relates to real estate transactions? What's going on? Well, we really are in a very unusual market environment. And when I say that, think for a second, right? January 1st, when, when, when you woke up, you looked forward to 2020. You never imagined you'd see this. But never. what did you know? What did you know in January? Inventory was shrinking. In mm -hmm. fact, it had been shrinking for at least six months. Based on our on our data at realtor.com, we were looking at double digit monthly contraction in the inventory, a strong signal that there was demand for the product um, in, in the market, again, spurred by low mortgage rates. So we were already in a market environment in which there were almost not enough homes for as many people as were interested in buying. Now, what happened when the pandemic hit? Well, we saw sellers pull back strongly for, from, from the market, and we've been tracking this information weekly. And we've had, we've, we've been looking at weekly listings uh, both total as well as new listings contracting by double digit hmm. week after week compared to a year ago. So it's clear sellers are still reluctant to wade into this uncertain market. At the same time, to your point, what we're seeing about prices, because of such tight inventory, there are still buyers. And in fact, it's worth remembering, there are people who basically have to, generally have to move for jobs have to move for family reasons, whatever it is, there's always a certain degree of movement which generates demand for housing. So there are clearly people out there looking uh, for homes in, in just about every market. The trouble is they're not finding enough homes. And as a result, prices and, and for sellers right now, there's very little incentive to just drop the price. So prices have been rising. And really the undercurrent to all of this has been the mortgage rate environment. We are literally at historic lows, right? We we hit a couple of weeks ago, Freddie Mac reached 3.16, so really low mortgage rates, which makes financing favorable for folks who still have a job, who feel fairly secure in, in that job. In addition, it allows a lot of buyers to actually stretch a little bit, right? So be, because of the low rates, uh, they can actually buy more, a little more house than normally they might have otherwise. So really right now, the market is, is trying to regain its footing. That's quite evident. The big question is, will sellers return to market? Because really without inventory, it's hard to sell. Mm -hmm. It's hard to sell on half, right? So as, as sellers return, and our expectation is that they will this summer, even if cautiously, we're going to see a bump up, a rebound, uh, as, as you know, sales uh, took quite a quite a dive uh, in April, and so did contract uh, signings. Understandably, right? It's, it yes. was very difficult environment to conduct transactions, as you pointed out. In some states, um, agents were not quite as free to to um, basically practice in their profession. So that obviously contributed to an environment in which we saw decreased sales. But going forward, mortgage rates are expected to remain fairly low. So the big question marks for me are, are sellers returning, number one. Two, is the economy, and more importantly, employment likely to rebound? We had a very interesting uh, report for May, right? Very unexpected. Yes, very unexpected. Employment. Um, and it's obvious, when you look at the actual job gains, half of those were in, in hospitality and restaurant industry. Mm -hmm. So clear signal that... Uh, that one, restaurants feel confident enough to open, that, that, that folks are, are going to, to eat, even though, as we know, it's, it's fairly, uh, a fairly different environment, a lot of curbside pickup, a lot of spacing, so lots of issues still to solve. But if that um, unemployment situation does not drag much beyond summer, 
we could be looking at a marked improvement. Yes. But those are question marks. Yeah, interesting. No, that's a great perspective, George. You know, one thing, I don't know if you track this, but it made me think of it. You know, I was looking at builder confidence uh, over the mm -hmm. past few months. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but ballpark, 8, 9, 10% of, of homes sold every year are new construction. And builder confidence was at a multi-decade low, right? And so to your point about supply, if the builders aren't building because they didn't know what was going to happen here, then that further impacts. So have you seen builder confidence come back? Do you think that that supply, and obviously there's a lag on that. You have to build homes, you have to build communities, right? That takes right. time. But what is the impact, do you think, of new home construction on the overall inventory picture this year? So an excellent question. In fact, when we entered 2020, uh, we, we had run a piece of research uh, on our blog pointing out um, the fact that over the past decade, given the number of households alone, in light of demographics, economic growth, employment, we ended up entering 2020 with an undersupply of new homes of about 3.8 million. Hmm. Significant, right? So to your point, home builders have been really cautious during this cycle. They learned a very tough lesson uh, in the last recession. In addition, during the last recession, we lost a great number of local and regional builders who never came to the market. So there are fewer builders in the market. They've been much more measured in their approach. The early signals back in January were that builders were actually going to expand their product offerings more towards the mid-range. Mm -hmm. They had put a part in the luxury upper end. They were going to push more towards the mid-range. And then the pandemic hit. In fact, I remember in the latter few weeks of March, there were still builders who had folks on building sites trying to push some of the product that was close to completion. But you're right, we saw a, a record drop in their confidence in April. There was a slight rebound in May, which right. to me is, is um, encouraging. But I think really from, from a um, demand standpoint, there's clear demand for, for homes just to, to, to put perspective around the number, think about the fact that we have the millennial generation. I know we talked about the millennials right yes. a lot over the last 10 years, but the truth is the largest demographic cohort in US history. This year alone, about 5 million of them are turning 30, right? Hard An to believe. Age which, uh, at which they're going to look at likely one of the other things, buying a home, right? Especially as they're getting older, they have families, kids. Um, Obviously, these play an important role. And we ran a survey in April in the middle of the pandemic and asked folks, what is it about their, their home that they value? Not surprisingly, a quiet neighborhood, um, having uh, basically uh, be, being around a family and having some separation from neighbors. But what were the things that they, they all of a sudden found in the middle of this pandemic? They wanted more or were inadequate about their home. And this was a, a nationally representative sample of, of consumers looking to buy. The number one thing they said they, they are interested in their next home, more space, number one. Two, more outdoor and better outdoor space, whether it's a yard, a patio, a terrace. Um, number three, they wanted more and better technology, whether it's faster Wi-Fi, whether it's smart home features, and of course, not surprisingly, an updated kitchen, right? right. Why are they different? A lot of the, the newer homes come with these a lot of these features already built in. So from my perspective, there's tremendous opportunity for builders going forward in meeting these new demands. Again, both demographic, but also as a result of what we're seeing from this pandemic, much more demand for work from home. And I know that's that's a topic in and of itself. No, it's it's actually a perfect segue, George. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> we didn't plan that, but that was a great segue. So, you know, when we look at um, work from home, work from anywhere, right? So here at List Reports, as I told you just a little bit ago, right, we've announced to all of our employees that they never have to come back to the office if they don't want to. And that in and of itself is, it's a big decision. And frankly, it's something for us as a company that we never really thought about before. I mean, we consider ourselves a very progressive technology company, really open-minded about how people work and where they work. And yet it wasn't part of our culture, but it was forced upon us. And in doing this, our observation has been that productivity is higher than it's ever been. There are some challenges with it. And so now to allow somebody the ability to leave the city or leave the state or leave the country potentially, right? So let's 
talk a little bit about this migration. There was some data out just a couple days ago about rents in the Bay Area, and not just in San Francisco City, but in Menlo Park, in Mountain View, right? These very expensive er areas that are not just urban, some of them are relatively suburban. But what's your perspective on this migration and what impact that might have on the industry? Excellent uh, question and a very timely one. In fact, for me, what I, I you know, want to start with on, on this topic is something that I've been really observing and thinking about ever since we, we, we had the commercial advent of the internet back in the you know, early to mid 90s. And really implicit in that, in, in you, you, know, you uh, are, as they say, you're old enough to remember it, implicit yeah. in that was the technology and technological innovation was going to free us in some sense from the traditional desks and allow us to basically be able to pretty much work from anywhere. Well, You're right, George. We were promised this world a very long time ago, weren't we? That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And so it really took it took quite a while. I mean, you think about it you know, over two decades. It um, took a pandemic, to be frank. Right. That's true. Absolutely. But the truth is, uh, you're right. Today's technology absolutely provides the ability for, for just about anyone working in, in a technological environment. Granted, not all jobs. Uh, if you're working in retail, in restaurant, in even manufacturing, you're still obviously tied to a uh, production or service place. But for a lot of employees who, whose work is more of a desk computer type job, you're right. The ability to work from anywhere is here. It's here today. In fact, it was here last year, but you're right. It took the pandemic for a lot of companies, number one, to be forced to try this experiment, which many of them were dipping their toes in. Um, and two, to come to terms with the fact that, as you pointed out, productivity uh, is still there. In fact, for some companies, they've seen increases in productivity. So why is this relevant to, to, to this topic? Because to your point, for the first time ever, the reality that workers can really work from anywhere and do so successfully is really a proven fact. Now, do I go from this to say, well, the you know office environment is dead? Not really, mm -hmm. partly because humans, right? We, we are social beings. We want to be around other people. So I don't think that we're going to, you know, all go to this model of sitting in our homes and just, you know, teleconferencing for the rest of our careers. But I do think that there's, this is a, an important shift for real estate. Um, and so to your point, we have already seen a shift in demand begin to take place the last couple of years in the market from two major groups, boomers and millennials. Boomers, because they obviously are beginning to retire, and in their retirement years, they are looking at places beyond the cities where they built their careers, coastal markets, you know, Boston, New York, uh, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Seattle. They're looking for places where the tax incidence in retirement is lower, yes. so states that have no state income tax, Florida, Tennessee, Texas. And at the same time, they're looking for quality of life, which is why you see a lot of demand in, in Sunbelt um, states. At the same time, we began to see millennials begin to make this transition for affordability reasons. A lot of millennials moved to the big cities to obviously start their careers and build them. So we saw lots of millennials move to downtown cores in the big cities over this last decade. The trouble is for many of them, the uh, home ownership dream never got much closer. So we began to see, like I said, the last couple of years, a lot of younger buyers begin to move to mid-sized cities in the middle of the country, think Cleveland, Nashville, um, Austin. And at the same time, um, basically we saw suburbs and towns within commuting distance of, of bigger cities also gain prominence. What I think this pandemic and this, this push now towards remote work is going to do is simply accelerate that trend. Um, when, when you look at, uh, and, and we touched a little bit upon that, when you look at the cost of living in, in a place like New York City or San Francisco, Silicon Valley, you're basically looking at really high expense housing. It, again, combined with all the other, whether it's taxation, or, it makes for obviously a very difficult um, proposition for many young, and you think people you know, around 30, for many young buyers. So if someone, for example, from, from the San Francisco Bay Area can leverage uh, the fact that a lot of tech companies have moved to places like Austin, um, obviously the housing proposition, lifestyle proposition becomes much more attractive 
Yeah. So I think this will continue being a trend in the market this year and beyond. And I think from my perspective is a real uh, positive. And why do I say that? Think about the fact that uh, really after the 90s, as, as a lot of globalization picked up speed, we had an entire section of the country, uh, particularly cities in the Rust Belt, think Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, which saw a real economic decline. What the current cycle has actually brought back is brought back the revitalization of a lot of the cities, driven by a lot of young uh, professionals, young families, millennials. Look at cities like Detroit, Cleveland today. You're going to see downtowns which have been completely transformed. Again, the urban renaissance that drove that. But at the same time, suburban environments have been revitalized as basically developers recognize that for young buyers, having a high density um, transit centric environment is important. So you've seen this, what I, I came to, to call the, urb, the downtown, suburban downtown core begin to emerge. Hmm. Think of mixed use developments, uh, apartments, condos on top, restaurants, bars, stores, experiential retail on the bottom, all within walkable, bikeable, transit friendly environment. So for someone from Manhattan, it makes it much easier to, to find a place like that in Connecticut, New Jersey, Long Island. And it, it doesn't feel as alienating as the suburbs of the late 80s and 90s might have. Absolutely. Oh, really well said, George. Thank you for that. I'm glad I asked the question because that's a fantastic answer. Um, let's, sort of, let's sort of move to wrap this up. And let's just talk for a couple minutes about um, what might come next, right? So we're looking mm -hmm. at um, a weird confluence of events, right? Obviously, the, the pandemic, there's a lot going on culturally right now. Um, we've got, uh, it's an election year, right? And so there's likely to be additional stimulus packages if necessary. Like, that's a very real possibility. And so, you know, how do you look at sort of the balance of 2020 coming into 2021? You know, what is what is what are you looking at as some of the sort of key markers or things that we should all be focused on? Absolutely. Um, from my perspective, I would say that the one of the most important markers is what has happened in um, capital markets as a result of the Federal Reserve intervention. And I know that for a lot of consumers, you know, they, they might glaze over at the Federal Reserve. Yeah. But if you look at the way the Federal Reserve responded during the 2008-9 recession, they obviously incorporated a lot of the lessons learned from earlier recessions and the Great Depression back in the early 1920s. Uh, so this time around, if you, you may remember, March 3rd was the Federal Reserve who basically announced a surprise 50 basis point increase, uh, I mean cut in their rate. It was really the first major institution to signal the severity of the things to come. Um, and so from that point forward, they really didn't stop. They continued cutting uh, interest rates practically to zero. They basically committed to asset purchases and they basically jumped into the mortgage-backed security market to make sure that there's liquidity there. They provided backstops for banks and lending institutions. They provided regulatory guidance so that these institutions can in turn be a lot more lenient with borrowers. Why? They recognize the importance of maintaining capital in uh, not only the markets, but ultimately in consumer in consumers' pockets. At the same time, to your point, we saw on the legislative side, Congress uh, step forward and, and make quite a big commitment to make sure that consumers, uh, again, have money to tie them over during this, this gap period of roughly three months. And so, to, from my perspective, all of these have actually combined to provide that, uh, that bridge because really we are, we're looking at, at a canyon that appeared underneath our feet suddenly. Yeah. So to have that bridge to carry us forward, right, to maintain employment, to avoid massive job losses is very important. So the reason I mentioned this is because looking at the balance of 2020, I think all of these are very important um, measures. When you look at forbearance, when you look at, at you know, the, trying to avoid renters from, from facing eviction, all of these I think were excellent uh, policy measures because ultimately, to our earlier point about U.S. economy driven by consumption, if the U.S. consumer is hurting and doesn't have the ability financially to pay bills, collectively we all suffer. So taking the effort, making the effort to actually ensure that all of us, in a sense, benefit from that, I think bodes well for the economy. 
we updated our, our forecast um, this, this last month. We had issued our forecast back in December. We were expecting a positive growth in GDP, more moderate than 2019, but still growth. We see uh, uh, obviously a retrenchment of that. And, and we this week, the National Bureau of Economic Research officially declared the recession began in February. So the big question is, are we going to see a quick rebound in GDP, a short recession? Or will the unemployment um, uh, numbers spill over into a longer, uh, prolonged uh, recession? From, from our perspective, looking at the broad picture, employment, mortgage rates, consumer health and finances, we actually see a fairly um, level year for the economy and for housing markets. And I, I say level only because we expect sales to obviously uh, see a decline. We expect prices to stay fairly level, again, in part because there's simply not enough inventory. Mm -hmm. So we see a rebound uh, in beginning this, obviously this, uh, the, probably more likely in July, more in earnest, July, August, September. Obviously a, a little bit of a delay in activity would have seen over the late spring, early summer. And then the big question mark for us from a market standpoint, what happens in the colder months? Seasonally speaking, as you know, October, November, December tends to That's be a right. time of the year. Uh, a lot of people take a, a break with, with the holidays, colder months, they don't think about housing. So will we have a delay effect where, where a lot of the activity gets pushed forward? Uh, we've already seen that the last two years where for a lot of buyers, they didn't take a break. Came December, January, they were still in the market. In fact, we, we ran a, a piece of research earlier this year looking at the fact that January became one of the, the, the busiest, um, at least for the last years, the busiest months of the year for buyers, many of whom had spent over a year looking for a home. And, and this is something that I think it's, it's worth remembering because inventory is so tight. We had this last year, 24%, almost one in uh, four Americans basically uh, spend over a year looking for their homes. So we are likely to see perhaps uh, some of that happen this year as well, where activity in November, December will stay fairly elevated. But in fairness, anybody giving you a forecast today, uh, you know, probably has a, a, about as much foresight as someone looking at, you know, a crystal ball. Uh, absolutely. I, I'd like to think you have a little bit more than that, given the, the depth that you're looking at this in. So, uh, George, uh, that's that's amazing. That's tremendous advice. I would say one last thing just to all of our agents out there is, you know, I, I have a lot of conviction that there's an opportunity right now as you look at your business in 2020 and 2021 to reach out to a new sphere of influence, and that is people who are in urban areas who are looking to migrate, right? And as a local expert in a market that might be an attractive place for them to migrate to, I actually think there's a really interesting opportunity to reach out to those people and to help them to understand the benefits of your town or your city. And if you look at, I saw some data from one of the other portals, George, uh, maybe three weeks ago, um, search activity in even rural areas is has spiked tremendously and certainly in suburban areas as people now consider what it might be like to live outside of a major city. So I think that's an interesting opportunity. George, um, thank you so much for joining today. Today is the first time I got to meet you. I, I'm I'm super impressed and extremely grateful. I hope this isn't the last time that we get to talk about this because I appreciate you taking the time to do this and your expertise and your knowledge on what's going on right now is so helpful. And I, I just can't tell you how grateful I am for you to be on the show today. Thank you, Rand. It's been a joy meeting you. I'm glad we had the chance to, to talk about this. And uh, I certainly share your hope uh, that we'll, we'll get to meet again. Absolutely. We definitely will. All right, George, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much again. Absolutely. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. Um, all right, everybody. That was fantastic. Um, so grateful for George to come on today. Uh, clearly amazing knowledge about what's happening right now. And I think a lot of really great uh, advice and help and understanding. And I would say to all of you, you know, we do shows all over the board. Some of them are light and fun tech reviews. Some of them are sort of thought leadership about the future. And some of them, I think, like this are is our hope that you're going to spend the time to deeply understand what's happening um, with the economy at this level, because I think it's critical as you plan for your own business and as you advise your customers. Um, real quick, I've got Realtor.com's YouTube page up here right now. Make sure you check it out. A lot of great content. George is on there. Subscribe to that channel. And until tomorrow, we'll see you soon. So be safe, be healthy, be happy, and we'll see you soon. Bye.